Hello everyone, I am Johnny Christ and this is Drinks with Johnny. Thank you so much for checking out the show and thanks to Sweet Drop CBD Oil. Uh, my buddy sent me a bunch of this stuff, been using it for months now. Um, and if you head over to sweetdrop.com, you can use promo code Drinks with Johnny, Drinks with J O H double N Y, and you can get 20% off your order. And I'm going to start off this show like I do every other show a little bit of Sweet Drop CBD. And that's uh, the blood orange flavor. They got other flavors over there. So head over to sweetdrop.com. Learn everything you need to know about CBD oil and what it can do for you. Now, this week, I am joined by a very special guest, a man of extremely a lot of talents. Um, he's, done, he's done everything. Uh, right now, he's listed himself on Instagram as a comedian. So let's bring on Joe Sib. How you doing, man? What up, Johnny? How are you? I'm doing fantastic, man. It's a Monday morning or whatever it is, and we're we're hanging out. It's great. Or we're, we're hanging. I love uh, I love your setup, man. I'm gonna tell you when we get out of this strange time that we're living in. You gotta have me over to the bar. I could Absolutely. do some real damage there. Like, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like, believe. I believe shirt, you can. Like, yeah. I already see myself shirt off, standing on the bar, <laughs> probably just just pouring some of that what do you got up there? you got some i see some vodkas i see some patron you got patron up there no i don't have patron i've got a bunch of different tequilas i got a bunch of different tequilas i got a, I I got a few different tequila. things i love it i can't i you know what tequila te the my drink is, i don't like to i like whiskey but then it makes me sad tequila keeps me stoked <laughs> I, I can understand that yeah no, i know i mean i like it all though i mean that's why i got the bar my, my, my thing is when people come over and uh i i offer them a drink it's not it's <laughs> it's not what do you have it's like i have everything what do yeah. you want <laughs> yeah 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 no it's it, when you asked me to do this uh we've been i know you and i've been talking about doing this forever but it yeah. was it was strange because before the pandemic you know I would, I would consider, you know, I would consider myself a drinker in the sense of like, if I'm out on a Friday night, definitely going to have a few beers. If I'm doing a show, you know, I'm going to have a beer afterwards. You know, I like a martini. I like a bourbon. Mm. Uh, but it was the craziest thing for some reason in January, 2020, I, I woke up on new year's day and I was like, yeah, you know what? Uh, I'm not going to drink today. And that was usually standard, mm -hmm. but then I was like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to drink the month of January. Like I was yeah. like, I've never done that. And then I started really thinking, and this is so sad. I was like, <laughs> wow, I have never not drank for a month since I was 15. Wow. Yeah. So even like the longest I've went is maybe like two weeks. I remember I had surgery on my knee and they said, and when I say drink, like I said, like I'm not like a, I never drank hard alcohol until yeah. I had kids. Cause I needed it. Once I had kids. <laughs> That's definitely you know, true. <laughs> yeah. You know, once, and not even when they were younger, I was like, I used to hold my son or my daughter and I used to be like, be my friend, uh, Lex had this thing, like two of the best things, you know, your kid and a beer at the same time, you're just holding your, you know, you're like, Oh my God, this is great. But I, I hear that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But like, I never, I never, even when we were kids, I never was hard alcohol guy. Like I just, I was always, this is so lame. I was like, Coors Lights, you know, Heineken's just drinking beers, going to shows. And there's nothing and wrong with the silver bullet. Coors I love Lights the silver, silver bullet. bullet, man. La Bala de Plata. Dude, we could drink, <laughs> you and I could drink like 40 silver bullets today and then like learn how to like fly airplanes. Like oh, we would easily. have no issue. I think that's, I think that's how, I think that's part of the course. You have to have 40 Coors Lights. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if but I learned anything was, from pilots, that's, that's yeah. gotta be. <laughs> but then what ended up happening was I was like, I'm not going to drink during January. And then, um, I did it and I was like, Oh wow. And then I was like, man, maybe I'm going to try February too. And I was like, Oh, I'll never last in February because I was going on the road and I was going to like New York, my favorite, you know, oh, Chicago. Yeah. I was hanging out with my nephew, um, and his partner, two gay men in the Bay area. I'm like, these guys party like there, it's, there's <laughs> you gotta, no way you gotta I won't be ready be. for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, even my nephew was like, dude, when you get here, we're drinking. And I'm like, no, you know, and then it was funny. All of a sudden I got through all of these moments and I was like, wow. And it was the end of February. And then I went out on the road in March and I was out, I was actually out on the East coast and I came home and we were, I was in San Francisco at the punchline doing shows when, when the pandemic literally yeah. We were the last show. I was the last wow. show at the Punchline in San Francisco. And I hadn't drank. So when the pandemic started, I was almost like, wow, it, now, you know, I have two choices. Either I dive into, you know, some beers 
or not. And I just decided not to. So I just, it, this is just the first year, this is the first year of my life that I've gone. I'm, what is it? August. And yeah, sure. you know, yeah it's, yeah. What are we at? September? We're Nine in September. Months. Yeah. So this is the longest that I've gone without like beers or shots or anything in crazy in ages. So it's well, weird. congrats but, on that, man. I, I do. I do a sober January every year. Me and the wife started yeah. doing it years ago. Like, okay, that's like that's like our recalibration. You know, it's like yeah. we take the month off. And then that, now that we're getting older, we're trying to find other months that we can call sober too. <laughs> just hasn't yeah. happened in a while. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. I know. And, and, and once you have the kids too, it's so hard. You know, oh, like, man. How many, how many uh, kids you got? I got two. You got two. Yeah. And how, how old? Uh, 19 and 16. I got a daughter that's 19 and a son that's 16. And, uh, yeah, you know, wow. yeah. Well, but congrats on that know, too. I got a, I got a three and a half year old. I just dropped off at school today. So wow, like, that's yeah. a great age. Boy or girl? <laughs> Boy. Ah, uh, the best. Yeah. Love the, the best, kid. the best <laughs> three and a half, three and a half. They're still, they're still treating you like like Mick Jagger or like Keith Richards when you when come does home. that when does that end I I, I, I keep oh, hearing about that dude at a certain point they're going to start teaching they're at a certain point they're going to start you know they're going to start treating you like your base tech like just get me that go come on <laughs> I treat my base tech very well <laughs> okay well dude can I tell you right now I I hope that your kids only treat you as well as you treat your tech because I'm telling you right now I get treated like an uber driver but the uber driver gets treated with better respect than me it's just, <laughs> I remember, I remember when my daughter used to wait out in front of the house for me and like, I'd come home and it was just like, it was like, it was like Bono from like U2 showing up at your house. It was just, it was like, oh my God, you know, like did Ozzy just walk into our pad? Like my kids were so into me. And then what ends up happening right around, you know, 12 with like with my daughter, it just, it was almost like someone came in in the middle of the night and told her, Hey, your dad's lame. Really? Okay. You know, like just <laughs> so much, just, you know, not that, not that, you know, we don't have a cool relationship, but it was just, it was definitely a change. And then with my son though, you know what? I feel like with boys though, it, they never, they never uh, lose. I mean, obviously what ends up happening is, and there's a, there's a book written on this mm -hmm. about how uh, sons, like the, it, the terminology is, and it's, it's, there's a term for it. It's like sons, have to kill their fathers to become their fathers. So Whoa. like ultimately, like me and my dad, you know, from the time I was like 15 till probably about, you know, 21, 22, we just didn't see eye to eye on anything. I was like, you know, I had my way, I was gonna do things, you know, he had his way. Yeah. And now at the age I am now, me and him are so similar, it's insane. It, you know, the way I live, the way, like I find myself doing things that that are so, something my dad would do, whether it's, you know, a financial thing or whether it's, you know, even that, you know, like something as simple as I won't leave dishes in the sink because my dad hates dishes in the sink. Like I'm just, it's just, you know what I'm saying? Like I, that's a I weird up, one. That's a weird one. Yeah. I get up early. Like I like to get up early. Like this morning I was up, you know, six, um, because my dad used to love to get up at six. His whole thing was, you know, I want to get up. I want to have that time in the morning to myself before the day starts. And as a kid, I was like, dude, I'll never do that. And then now I'm that dude. Well, it's that just, makes sense. Cause I mean, if I, I mean, I usually wake up a little later and then I don't have the mornings. Cause as you know, with kids, you're just like, yeah. Oh, I don't even get to watch what I want on TV. It's fucking done. Yeah. You uh, already got your cartoons on. I just woke up and yeah. I'm trying to get myself a coffee and you're, dude, can I tell you right now <laughs> with kids, with kids, I always approached my kids like a band. I was always like, and I was the manager, and I literally treated it like, I am going to, I have to be ahead of them. So I got to be up. Like if my kids, like when my kids, you know, because my gig, you know, be, be, during the like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, or even early high school until they start going by themselves, mm -hmm. um, my gig was I would at the age that you're at, I would get up and have like. I would have my time where I'm like, okay, this is what I need to do today. This is my, I got my coffee. I got this so that when they woke up and the chaos started, I was already been in, in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I would beat them to the punch. It's almost like a manager going to the venue, getting the dressing room set up, getting the sound check ready to go. So when the band rolls in, there's nothing, you know, like I've already got it all dialed in because the one thing my wife and I used to always say was if you get behind the ball and they start, yeah, you know they start rolling you. Mm -hmm. Oh my! You're, there's no way to catch up. You're screwed. But I like yeah. I like your analogy there with the manager and the band stuff. Let's bring up some of the band stuff. I mean, you were totally. You were with. Uh, you're in 22 Jacks with uh, Chris Sheffield of uh, yep. of the Foo, and then um, uh, 
wax back in the 90s back was, in the 90s yeah was 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 uh yeah the 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 video for california if i'm not mistaken Spike jones video yeah the Spike, Spike jones, jones video. Fire video yeah, yeah. and then you did i mean this let, let's just get into all the fucking music and then you started side one dummy records yeah. i mean this is all the stuff that like this is our connection right this is like the musical connection right here and totally then, and then you end up you know being DJ on uh, the Metallica tour with uh, yep. Jim Brewer, and now you're a comedian. You got the podcast. I mean, these are all the things. This is what I said at the top of the show. This guy literally does everything. <laughs> it's amazing. So talk to me a little bit about um, punk rock in the '90s and what it was like being uh, doing doing Wax and the whole nine. And then what what was the inspiration for coming coming to Side One Dummy Records? Yeah, I mean, I think think for me, I I was lucky. I always say I was lucky. I grew I was an '80s kid. Uh, I grew up in the right place at the right time when mm -hmm. punk rock hit the suburbs. Uh, the bands that I loved were Bad Religion, Adolescence, Circle Jerks. It was really oh, that yeah. second wave of American punk rock. I mean, of course, you know, I was raised on the Sex Pistols and the Damned. I loved the Ramones, that first generation. But the second generation that really got me and really spoke to me were the bands that were coming out of LA, mm -hmm. like the Circle Jerks, Black Flag, Adolescence, those bands, especially Adolescence, they really spoke to me in a way, um, and at a t particular time in my life, that that style of music and the lyrics just were what I needed. You know, I was a 15 year old kid from a divorced family, living with my mom, ultimately moved in with my dad in San Jose. And at that time, the thing that I didn't realize, it was just, like I said, I was in the right place at the right time because uh, being in San Jose, we were about 40 minutes away from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So every band, whether it was, you know, the first time GBH came over, The Exploited, Peter and the Test Two Babies, The Addicts, or, um, you know, bands like, I was, you know, the first time Agent Orange played in San Francisco, I was mm -hmm. there. Uh, bands like... Uh, like I said, Circle Jerks, got to see the original lineup with, or the second lineup with um, Henry Rollins when he started singing for Black Flag and, you know, had come in and replaced the singer. So I was just in this moment of time where I was able to see all of these shows, you know, the original lineup of Social Distortion, which ultimately that was like one of my favorite bands. Really, yeah. I think bands like Social Distortion, bands like The Adolescents really put me on a path that I ultimately would follow forever. And then, well, then you, you combine... end up, you end up being a part of that next, uh, the next generation. Like those were the ones that inspired you and you end up being part of the next generation with, and being in the Bay area makes perfect sense. A lot of the guys were coming from Berkeley. You're coming yeah. from San Jose, you know, that, 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 that must've been, I mean, that was a hot, that was a hotbed for uh, the nineties punk that came but out. But you know, what's so fun, funny though, Johnny is like at the time you don't really, you know, for me, it was like the eighties, where the time, like for me, it's like from like 82 till the time I moved to LA to start wax, which is in 90. So I was 82 to 90 was really like going to, I would say like college almost of music because mm -hmm. you had, you had bands like Operation Ivy, Rancid hadn't formed yet. You had a, you know, you had the Gilman club. Uh, there was another club up there called the farm. Uh, I had just kind of gone through the old school clubs that, um, the on Broadway and the Mab. These were these were clubs where the bigger bands would play at the and, mm -hmm. and shows when punk rock like 82, 83, like first time I saw Bad Religion, you know, was up at the on Broadway, uh, Circle Jerks. First time I saw them was at the Mab in San Francisco. So then all of a sudden, you know, as as I was going to these shows, there was also a transition too where where a lot of bands, you know, towards the the 85, 86 we all got really inspired by bands like Metallica, you know, bands like, you know, and then there were bands came like corrosion of conformity, verbal abuse, like all these bands right, got yeah. really inspired by metal. We all got inspired of course, by, you know, in our own backyard, there was this band, you know, Metallica that was really combining like, like you know, the, the, sound, the sound of, and the energy of what you love from punk rock, but also, you know, going wider with it, with, with these epic songs, but still it was, it was still speaking to, punkers and meddlers at the same time so that was like this great fusion and then i would say the the other element that really helped shape me was growing up in san jose was there was a you know the skateboarding scene in san jose at that point was amazing and you had got you know you had steve caballero you mm. know being our ultimately at that point being you know the, the best skateboarder in the world but he was also in a punk band called the faction and he was a friend of mine and he was someone that was approached, you know, he, you just, it was like, he was, it was like, 
it's like the way when people say like, what was it like growing up with Steve Caballero? It's like, it's like growing up with Michael Jordan, but you don't know it's Michael Jordan. You're just like, wow, he's really good at <laughs> well, basketball. Well, that's weird. Not everyone has that experience. That's a weird yeah. <laughs> And I just, my whole life growing up skating with Stevie and, um, and, and watching him skate and watching him progress, all of our friends, you just, you had this one friend that, you know, was, he was a legendary, but it was pre-internet. So, you know, yeah, was he on the cover of Action Now, Thrasher Magazine, all of these magazines, but he never carried himself in a way around his friends like yeah i'm better you know i'm better than you he was just you know it it wasn't uncommon to see stevie at the punk show and then the next day at the ramp and then that night at a you know skating a curb and you're just like oh there's steve but looking back on it you're like you know he was just so better and his ability is you know he he, he was yeah he was he was above everybody else and it was obvious yeah and as a kid you even knew like did you skate a lot too then obviously you're friends with that's all i did yeah Yeah, for me skate yeah for me for me all like my whole life it was it it went skateboarding number one punk rock that was like from the time i was a little about 12 years old it was i started skateboarding when i was seven and then i really got into it you know from like you know 11 12 uh and then do you, when, have when you I been skate, back on the board in a minute I, 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 oh you, i skate i skate all the time and i surf rad. every day oh dude and we gotta go surfing base, we gotta go surfing totally i'm yeah. i'm dog shit at surfing so you're actually oh. probably really good i'm oh, i just started when i was 25 oh go oh, shit that's been 10 years now already yeah. uh but yeah uh i grew up here in huntington beach similar loved punk rock and skating i never really skated though i just liked it yeah. i fell one time and i was like eh, this isn't for me <laughs> so true and but, you know what though i'll say this dude at at you know 35 36 i would say this like if you're gonna skate like skating is one of those things where like i have been on a skateboard since i was seven right and 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 in that and i feel more comfortable on a skateboard skating than i would surfing now with the amount of surfing i do just because i've spent so much time in the water now because yeah. of the pandemic and i have a lot more time surfing i'm way more confident and and I have a lot of fun, but I would say, whenever I see friends, they're like, "Yeah, dude, I want to go. I want to go. I want to go skating." I'm like, if you didn't grow up skateboarding, 35 years old is not the time <laughs> to start skateboarding because I can tell you how it's going to end. It's going to end with broken wrists. It's going <laughs> to yeah. end with a broken femur. It's it's things that like you're going to break that like you like right now you you can't. Your wife will have no sympathy for you when you go. Oh, I broke my broke my arm skating she's like i don't care you still got to go pick up our, our little man at school figure it out and you're like i can't drive too bad too bad bro yeah i broke my femur feel sorry for me no like once you have kids there is no sympathy for the yeah, dad i'm like, learning that i'm dad learning can, that. like lose both his arms and your wife i don't care figure it out bro you got to get in there like it's so you do not want to start i i say this stick to surfing huntington's yeah. great I, think there, I love surfing. The, the, when you fall and I eat shit all the time, it's it's fine. I'm in the water. Yeah. <laughs> Just you hold your breath. Longboarding, and you ready for this? You go longboarding. You get a nine zero. You get a nine four. Maybe mm. a nine six. You paddle out. You're with your bros. You don't need to go out on some massive day. Get a couple waves, dude. You get one wave, dude. There's waves. Sometimes I'll. Well, get that's all it is wave. for me. Is 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 yeah. is if I get one wave while I'm out there that I feel good about. That'll keep me coming back. Same way with golf. I don't know if you golf, but it's the same with, for me with golf. I go out there. If I have one good shot on the day, I'm like, I can do that again. Yeah. <laughs> I have such a, I have such a, like, if I like something, I like, either I like something, either I love something or I'm not into it at all. And that's the only reason why I've never gotten into golf because I'm afraid I'm going to like it too much and it's going to take over my life. Well, you should Could definitely, yeah, it, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, it does for some, for me, it's, it's just a fun hobby there at, where I get to go out. I get to be outside, smack some balls and drink some beers. Like that's yeah. all, that's all I care about. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a, I'm terrible at it. I'm terrible at surfing too. I, I like to do all these things, but I'm just not very good at them. <laughs> yeah. But you know what though, dude, it's, you know, it's like, it's how you measure it, man. It's yeah. like, I always, it's like, I'm really good at having man. fun. I'm really good yeah. at having fun. And you know what, man, like, I, I think that's way more important than actually like ripping at something. Like yeah. I rather, I rather, I, I, same here, whether it's surfing, um, you know, there's other things that I love to do, but it's like, they always say success is how you measure it. And if you're having fun and you're in the water, that's all that matters. Totally.
So you, you know? met, you mentioned your college years were kind of like, uh, in, in San Jose growing up there. My college years were, uh, like not actual college. I didn't actually go to college. My college years I consider as like the Vans Warped Tour when we were doing yep. those. I was like early on. And I know at Side One Dummy Records, you guys did some of those uh, Warped Tour comps, right? We did them all. Yeah. That was how I, that was originally how I like found out about, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how I met you guys. That was how I remember with uh, basically like, so the, the warp Tour definitely like for me, you know, I would say for me personally, um, it was like when I, when I use the word college, I, I'm using that as like the school of, learning about music that was mm -hmm. definitely those i would say like 80 <clears throat> 85 to like you know or 82 to 80 82 to about 90 is when i'm in the bay area mm -hmm. i did go to college and when i graduated i was in a band and i got kicked out of the band and i was in this this like basically <clears throat> this kind of i don't know this limbo period where it was <clears throat> excuse me okay i was in this limbo period where I was like, am I going to start a band in Bay Area or should I think about doing something else? And a, <clears throat> a buddy of mine was living in L.A. and he was working at Slash Records. And he was like, dude, get down here to L.A. because there's nothing going on for you in San Jose. And at that point, that was where the music industry was. Mm -hmm. And what took, you know, a year in the Bay Area, you could get done in a month in L.A. And I came down, moved in with him, gave me a month on his couch. And in that month, I kind of met a guy like, hey, got a place to live, found a job. And then I was able to like go, all right, I want to start a band. What and was that job people. in L.A., though? What was that? Uh, I worked job? at I worked at a prop house, a prop house on Brea Boulevard where oh, Brea. they would come in like, you know, like, hey, we just did a, a you know, we just did a Heineken commercial or, hey, this movie just finished and these huge trucks would come in. And my gig was to unload the trucks and they had okay. all the props for the movies, like everything. And, you know. Then there and the, and and then it was a prop house, and also directors would come in and set designers would come in. And All right, be, would, be honest. Did you did you snag anything really cool from that? You know what? It's funny that you say that because um, there was a there was a lot of opportunity that you could go like, oh wow, you know. Um, but it would be stuff like if you were going to snake anything, the stuff that you would snake would be like oh, wow, the, this mug was used on Lost in Space. All right, I'll pinch that. Like, it wasn't, <laughs> yeah, it I was gotcha. very, yeah. And like the stuff that you would want to steal was the musical instruments, but they were totally locked down behind this thing. And, oh, you know, yeah. you, I would go in there at lunch. That was one thing that was super cool was when I was starting Wax, um, I every, at lunchtime, I would go into this room and you could just play guitars and I, I actually ended up writing like a first, a, a couple of our first songs at lunch on these acoustics that they had in there and then taking it to That's band rad. practice. Yeah, it was That's super rad. Cool. Yeah, it was super cool. That worked was, out really a, nice. That was a nice job yeah, to have there. Yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a trip too, because, you know, it, like I said, it's, you know, at this point it's like 90 and like, you know, I remember like Ice T would come in and he'd have to pick out what he wanted because, you know, music videos at that point were just huge. Oh, yeah. So there was, you know, every, whether it was like Motley Crue, you know, like, oh, dude, they, these are these are the, the props that are going to be in the new Motley Crue video or, you know, like I said, Ice T came in, you know, so there was. There was definitely an energy in Hollywood at that point that I was so stoked to be a part of. And at that moment, though, I remember, though, I knew right away, though, I did not want to work in props because it just, you know, I wanted to be in a band. So mm -hmm. I just, as much as I was working there, I was always kind of, you know, I was always kind of fucking off and trying to make a phone call to like book a show or trying to talk to the, you know, so they, you know, I was, I, when it was time, you know, when, when I worked there, I worked, but uh, it definitely, I knew while I was there, this isn't for me because yeah. it was like they wanted you to join a union and like you know take it seriously. That and was, was a like, paycheck to get to 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 get you through. It was just the it. next step for me to get to being in a band, which ultimately, when I met the three guys, and we from Chicago and we started Wax, it went quick because we got signed um, in six months to Caroline Records mm. out of New York, and we were in the studio making you know our first record, and I remember just going, "Holy shit!" Like. You know what like it what my friend said you know i'd been in la or i'm sorry i'd been in northern california with my first band frontline slugging it out for you know six years and no we couldn't really get like notoriety but when i joined this band with these three guys from you know chicago like it just you know how it is dude like when yeah. it just meshes right away and everything like you you just know like wow this is moving along a lot quicker than 
than anything has before. And there's well, just I got really lucky momentum. on that because with the, the, when I was 18 is when I joined Avenged Sevenfold and haven't yeah. looked back. <laughs> yeah. But, but were you in any other bands before that? I mean, garage bands. Yeah, I mean, no, yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying, though. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yeah, totally, yeah. totally. That was, so you yeah, know what I'm saying? Think, like, when you start playing when I started with Avenged, playing, Yeah, when I started playing with, with Jimmy specifically, that was the first time I, I like, felt like I could do this. And it was like, yeah. oh, this is awesome. Like, yeah. I, I can do this. And what I'm saying is, is, as a musician and as anything in this world, whether you're an artist, whether you're, you know, you're into finance, whether you're into starting your own business, you're going to have moments that you try something that, and, and it's not going to work. Like, I'm yeah. sure for you, like in the garage band, you're like, wow, like I love playing music, but maybe it's not for me. And when, and the maybe it's not for me just might be the, the, the chemistry between you and the other band members or the sound or or you know the 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 way the art's being created for me like when i was in my earlier bands you know we were doing well but we could never kind of make it over this hump or like we didn't have that thing yeah. that i saw other bands have and then when i when i started wax i knew the first show we ever played i was like wow this band has that thing that's just you can't even put your finger on that's untangible it's just that and, magic and it's just that magic, that well, magic what, what was what, that show what was that show well the first show i remember the first you know we, we we wrote like six songs we played a party and and after the the six songs we played them again and everyone was like wow this is cool and then we got booked at the first show we ever got booked is it were it, it was at this uh it was this it, it's it's now if it's still around it's called cheetahs in in hollywood the strip club but back then it was this other it was called the shamrock and we got booked at this club in hollywood and i remember the the the, the thing that you couldn't put your finger on that like untangible thing that thing we were like what is it about this band mm -hmm. was that all four dudes in the band could have been front man like loomis our our drummer you know obviously he went on to do all the stuff with with um the dudes in jackass but like he had a he was a very charismatic guy. He was a very unique looking guy. He was a great songwriter and he was the drummer. So like yeah. starting with the drummer, you have this guy that, I mean, ultimately you're like, okay, who, what's his story? Then you had a guitar player that just played like these amazing riffs and like everything was so unique and different. And he looked cool. His name was, and his name is soda, you know, and then you had this other guy <laughs> named Dave who just looked cool on the bass kind of a Paul Simonon, just like laying it down and just, he super charismatic, and then you had me. So it was like you had four dudes that like could have ran the show. And I just knew right away that's the reason why it's going to work. Like I don't have to explain to the bass player, hey, dude, when you're playing bass, you know, look cool or hey, you know, like everyone knew. <laughs> everyone you know was there. Yeah, no, totally. I laugh everyone because it's totally there. true, though, but it's, it's also funny. Like, <laughs> why do you? It's just like the other side of stuff that people probably wouldn't realize. Like, you got it. It, do this so that you look this way. <laughs> it's totally. Well, dude, how many it, times it, it comes natural to some people and to other people it yeah. doesn't, you know, it's and just, you know what, man? And, 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 be, and then, you know, one thing, like we'll talk about side one dummy in a, in a, in a second, but you know, like running side one dummy for 25 years, independent company with my, you know, partner, Bill mm -hmm. Armstrong. One of the things we've always said to each other is you can't teach someone how to rock. You can't like, yeah. you can teach someone who knows how to rock to mellow out a little bit. Like, Hey dude, Maybe we don't do a stage dive first song. Maybe we save that for the sixth song. You know, hey man, maybe you don't take your shirt off right when we come out. Maybe mm. you save that to the end. Yeah. Hey man, maybe you don't throw the drum set into the crowd the second song. Maybe we don't do that. But <laughs> see, that, that's a person that knows how to rock. Yeah. But what you can't teach is someone that's on stage and you're like, dude, you know, you like, I don't know. Like even when someone shows up, I remember the guys in wax when they showed up to the show, what they were wearing was cool. But I remember being in bands before that. And you know, this someone shows up and you're like, dude, are you wearing a vest? Like we're not wearing the vest, bro. <laughs> you, know, are, you know what I'm saying? Or like, yeah. Like, well, I'm usually, I'm usually that guy. Those? I'm that guy though. Cause I have the loud jackets. I have the loud clothes and everyone's like, what the fuck are you wearing? And I'm just like, this is me. This is how I yeah. roll. That's how I roll. But but I remember though, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, there was those bands, whether it was social distortion or, you know, for me, you know, obviously like bands like social distortion that like had a look, had a mm -hmm. vibe, you know, I was I, you know, misfits, all that stuff. I loved it all. Um, but I, I will say that 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 line that we used to say to each other, you can't see someone rock, I always followed up with, 
with the fact that you can't teach someone how to rock and trust me because I have tried. I have tried so <laughs> hard over the 25 years to teach the front man that won't, that no dude, maybe you do this, you do that. And you, it's so weird. It's like teaching someone how to fuck. Either you know how to have <laughs> sex or you got to learn on your own, bro. And you got to practice by yourself a practice lot. Practice by yourself a lot. Yeah. <laughs> It's just either you know how to have sex and you're going to be rad once it's like, all right, this is go time and you know your moves and you know what you're going to do or you don't. And and I really feel that music's the same way. It's like either you have that natural that, you know, it's it's like there's so many artists that, you know, like look at Guns N' Roses or, mm -hmm. you know, even ACDC. It's like like it's it's either you got it or you don't. You cannot teach that. You can't fake the funk, dude. You, 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 you can't. can't man. You just you can't. can't. Yeah, it's funny that you you you, uh, you brought up uh, before I hit record here. You were talking about how on your podcast, you know, you're used to uh, uh, running the show and stuff, and then you're like, "Oh man, I didn't hit record." And we were just yeah. talking about that right before you were. Stuck. I think you alluded to the fact that you had Duff on your show. Did you have Duff McKay? No, I was gonna say no. Duff and I, uh, I've known Duff. You know, God, I've no, I mean, him and I have known each other kind of off and on from when I was on Indy One Hundred Three One. Mm -hmm. It was a really strange thing. Like he. Uh, you know, um, I always knew his, you know, punk rock background just from growing up in the Bay Area. You know, I knew he was from Seattle. And, you know, one of the reasons I I, I think I liked Guns N' Roses was because um, on that first album, you know, he he was like the punker in the band. You know, he yeah. had the CBGB shirt on or a Ramon shirt. He kind of had that Sid Vicious look, which spoke to like me and my crew. But years later, when when we um, when I was on Indie 1031, one night I was DJing. And uh, there was this line that you could call into the studio that was only it was only the program director or like if you worked at the station, like Steve Jones had that line, you know, Dave Navarro had that line. So there were, it wouldn't be uncommon that you'd be on the air and then like Jonesy would call up and be like, yo, mate, well, you know, what was that song you just played? And I'd be like, oh, it's the Methadones from Chicago. And he'd be mm -hmm. like, can you leave that for me so I can play it tomorrow? Absolutely. Boom. It's on, you know, it's sitting here on the on the console. All right. Later. But one night I'm on there. And I get a phone call and, uh, and it's, it's Duff's wife, Susan and him. And I had just played the damned and mm -hmm. she's like, did you just play disco man by the damned? And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, my husband says he has to, like the way you talk, he, my husband keeps telling me he has to know you. And I'm like, all right, like, who's your husband? And she's like, I, I'm, I'm here. And like, you could hear both people talking and he's like, it's me, Duff. Duff McKagan, I'm like, oh, dude, like, what's up? Like, you know, I, well, you know, we met one time at an indie event. He's like, oh my God, did you just play DOA? And I was like, yeah. And then, you know, we just, I got his number and and it was funny because, you know, of course, you know, I called him and, and we became friendly, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I'll never forget um, one point he called me and I was like on the phone and I, and I was like, hey, dude, I, I, I might have to call you back. And he's like, you know, like, what's up? And I'm like, Ah, oh, dude, I'm just dealing with my daughter right now. And he's like, oh, really? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, is everything cool? I'm like, yeah, dude, everything's cool. But, you know, she's 13. And he just starts laughing. And I go, what, what's so funny? And then he kind of yells over the phone, Susan, um, Joe's daughter's 13. Is there anything, you know, you can tell him? And they just both start laughing. And <laughs> it was right around that time period where my daughter was kind of going from, like, dad's cool to dad's lame. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, dude. You know how lame my daughter thinks I am? They won't let me drop me, drop them off at school. They go, Dad, can you come? You come to school and you got your sleeves are cut. I mean, Dad, why can't you wear like a shirt with long sleeves? Like, God, it's so lame. And I was like, I was like, dude, you're deaf from Guns N' Roses, and they think you're lame. He goes, totally. And I was like, it made me feel so much better. And we just oh, yeah. started laughing. That's and hilarious. Then I, I remember that that day. I was like, when I hung up the phone, I was like, if you would have told me in 1985 or 86 when i was sitting in my friend's truck and we put on guns and roses appetite for destruction and i remember it was one of those moments where like no one's talking because everyone's trying to get their head around axel's voice but then you're loving the riffs and then you're kind of like it's it's kind of like aerosmith but it's not it's tougher wow it's it's darker but damn this is good and you're just you're just taking yeah. it all in and and if you would have some me, good oh, descriptions right there i'm sorry to cut you off there but like yeah. that's some good descriptions of appetite for destruction right there. yeah you know it was that. it was so what you know i mean for anyone 
that you know is obviously younger they're like yeah i grew up with this record i hear it on the radio all the time but like you got to remember there was a moment when this record was so underground you couldn't get it anywhere no one even knew about it and it was so out of left field because it was like it was this hybrid of music that you know music was punk and metal and we were kind of getting tired of that and then there was this glam thing going on that you're like dude i'm not gonna walk around in spandex so you you know if you were a rock <laughs> you weren't down for that or, joe i i, I, no, I was totally down see, i could totally see you in some spandex bro <laughs> oh my god dude if i was in i'm a short dude so if you put me in spandex i look like napoleon like i am so <laughs> like it just takes off even shorter like i'm so small, I, I, so I i totally get that I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big guy as you know yeah, either. <laughs> yeah I wanted to be like you know what I'm saying like I wanted to be like Joey Ramone or like you know six foot six you know like I wanted to be a tall guy I'm like I'm lucky if I'm 5'11 on certain days it's like it's just not happening you know like I like I put wait I wait wait put lips. you're complaining about being 5'11 I'm 5'6 over here <laughs> okay there you go yeah I got four inches on you you know um the, the thing the thing that uh the thing five inches the thing that um i like how that you was, corrected your math there I, I like yeah because yeah, <laughs> i don't want anyone to go they're and gonna write, comment oh, later and be like oh he, he doesn't know math joseph's lame dude he totally <laughs> got the date of appetite wrong and he doesn't know that it's six plus five is eleven um so then i was i was sitting there though but when i hung up the phone I, I, I was laughing because I was like, man, if you would have told me when I was, you know, whatever, 18 or 19, first time I heard Appetite, and then if you would have said to me, hey, man, you know, you are you digging Guns N' Roses? Yeah, totally. We'll check it out someday. You know, you're going to be friendly with the bass player. I'd be like, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, he's going to be, he's, you guys are going to be friendly and check it out. You're not going to be talking about music. You're going to be talking about your kids and how you're raising them. <laughs> I would have been like, what are you talking about? But um, yeah, yeah he's awesome. uh, yeah, he's definitely always been a super cool dude. And I actually had him on um, when I did. Uh, I interviewed him when I was on Indie 1031. He was on Complete Control, and I'm just solid dude. And yeah. I'm such a you know like that band Guns N' Roses. You know, th this they're one of those bands that I was I was just so stoked to be in the right place at the right time when when they came out. The thing that's even cooler is my partner at Side One. He was here in LA when they came. So he was seeing them at parties. He was seeing them at, Jeez. you know, like, just like, you know, he talks about seeing them at the Troubadour with like no one there. I think he went and saw them at that. They did a show, um, this Sunset Junction back in the day. They used to have this outdoor mm -hmm. festival. We saw Guns N' Roses there, but yeah. So that's definitely one of those bands, but it's funny how parenting and, you know, it doesn't change, you know, the same, the same, hurdles you have as a dad are the same hurdles that you know people that we admire whether it's duff or whether it's you know your neighbor across the street it's just raising a family and you it, kind it, of a correct me if i'm wrong here but you kind of attribute that to why you kind of went into comedy right i mean that was kind of like totally like what what the preface of of that story that you just told right there is kind of like where you're like <coughs> it, you, you, you hit this moment where you're like well, we're all in it together and it's fucking really funny. So I'm going to start doing comedy about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I wish, you know, I think the thing for me was the, the only, the reason I truly got into comedy was, you know, and you know, this from playing music, it's mm -hmm. when you're the singer, you're the vibe of the band. So when I ended, when 22 Jacks, when wax ended, you know, I started 22 Jacks. And at that point I had started side one dummy records, independent label. My partner and I still own it 25 years. Um, you wow. know, we started 25 you know, years. We start, 25 Congrats. years that we've Congrats, had it, man. Yeah. And, um, 25 years and we, you know, we started out super small. It was me and him and one other guy. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you start growing, um, start, we signed, you know, a few bands, nothing really stuck. And then we ended up signing this band, Floggy Molly. Yeah. And I was going to ask they, about they were, that. Yeah. What, what, yeah. When was, when, what year was that when you, when you signed? That was that? around 95, 96 first okay. record that we put out and it's just, it was right around that era, 96, I think. And um, we put out the first record, Swagger. And it just it just started to connect in a way that we knew. Like, once again, going back to what you and I were talking about with Avenge mm -hmm. or Wax, you just know something's up. You know, like yeah. when I went to see them, I remember just going, okay, if it's not this band, <clears throat> I don't know what band it is. Because they just, they, they had Dave King, totally charismatic. Um, you know, he obviously had a background that was huge from, you know, being Dave King of fast way. So he, he knew the game, he knew how to play it. He sang amazing. But what he did was, is he, he really leaned back on his upbringing and being involved with traditional Irish music, but mm -hmm. not making it 
all folky. He was like, I want to, I want to do that style of music, but I also want to infuse like uh, if there was a modern day version of like the clash, you know, or, or the, or almost like ACDC, like he really wanted to fuse it together. And then on top of it, he fused it together with, you know, uh, a lineup of individuals that could have all been front people. I mean, they're yeah. just, you know, from Nathan Maxwell on bass, the guy looks so cool. And then you had, you know, Dennis Casey on guitar, George Swin on, you know, drums. And then of course you, and then you throw in this crazy element of another, just what, isn't that Matt Hensley legendary skateboarder on accordion? Yeah, it is. You know, and you got Bridget on fiddle, you got Bob. It was just this lineup that was just, they were so cool. And it really it is incredible. Out. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of uh, playing a, festival or two with them and i went out and checked out checked out the 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 show and that you're right the chemistry and the the energy that they that they put forth on stage is you know it's it's one of those it factors as you said it's just and, it's just something to be back yeah and back to what you said about warp tour that once again you know was another moment in time where like where if i'm calling like for me 85 to you know 90 was like college for punk rock mm -hmm. i would definitely say those warp tour years were um that was like getting my master's degree because we really i learned so much you know from kevin lyman first of all because i'd known him since i was a little kid mm -hmm. i met him at fender's ballroom when i was in my first band he was always cool to me when i came to hollywood he gave me my first job unloading a truck you know after a show uh, so to get to start working with the warp tour and then we tour compilation side one dummy, that was how, you know, I was able to really keep my finger on the pulse at that point for, you know, 20 years of what music was happening and what wasn't, I don't think, I don't think side one dummy, you know, we were able to stay current and we were able to sign the bands that we always wanted to sign because I think by doing the warp tour compilation, we always got to hear what was coming. You know, that was yeah. the first place I heard Avenge and, you know, like, wow, okay, this is a fusion of like metal, but it's different than it's not this type, you know, it's like, this is different, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and for me that, um, was so good because I was able to always go to the warp tour and walk around and go, okay, I can see a band like Avenge, or I can go see this pop punk thing, or I can go see this indie thing, or I can go see this, you know, rapper. And, and it really was it's, such, and it's such a, a cool, yeah. Lineup. I mean, that's, my first warp tour that that we played on was in 2003 and i remember like yeah the, it was so cool i mean rancid and no effects i yeah. were playing the, you know the main stage we're on one of the side stage i think the maurice stage if i'm not mistaken or volcom stage whatever it was it was it was down there and you know i was able to walk around and the camaraderie too that was the, that was the thing that like for me and i've said, said it on the show several times people have heard me say about it um the camaraderie and what you learn from being on a warp tour is just like you you can't get that anywhere else like i'm i'm looking at my idols you know and yeah we're just hanging out at a barbecue after after the gig and everyone's helping each other out everyone's like you know helping you get to the next place because as you know it, it can be pretty fucking grueling you wake up in oh, the morning totally. and then you're like you're like oh shit i gotta go on in 20 minutes fuck yeah <laughs> you find out i remember the thing about the warp tour i used to say to people you know be careful what you wish for because if you want to go on tour and, and when you're doing the warp tour and especially bands that had to do it in a van i had to, you know i was lucky enough to do it in a van i was you know two times with 22 jacks and then i also you know was able to come out and be on a bus Yep, I've uh, done both. <laughs> but but yeah, you know, when you do both, you you know, I really feel that it it, it it's really going to decide whether or not you're cut out for that game. Mm -hmm. And and at least for me, for for you know, for where I come from, and and my attitude and the way I was brought up was like the show must go on under all circumstances. Like I've never pulled out of a show ever in my entire life. And there's and a lot of people would say like, oh well, you know, there would be people that would. Oh, I don't want to do a show tonight because my voice, you know, is out or I don't want to do a show because I'm sick or I don't, and I, you know, it's like, I always had the attitude that that the show has to go on. Like, it's like, it, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the reasons I love Dave Grohl so much is when he broke his leg in Sweden or wherever it was and went to the hospital, came back and did the show. I was like, that to me is what it's all about. It's you do the show no matter what. Some people might think, oh, well, that's silly. You know, why, why, why do that? You know, you know, and I just, I don't buy into that at all. And the thing mm -hmm. I loved about the Warped Tour is it, it really 
it really cut the people out that weren't cut out for it. And there's a lot of bands that would bitch and moan about it. You know, lots of bands that say they hated the Warped Tour. A lot of bands that that didn't like the way it was set up. And, uh, and you know, that's, their, that's interesting that's to their, me. I, I never heard any of that. <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess I just surrounded myself with the, with like minded no, people. <laughs> I would just say there was bands, there was bands that were like, we don't like not knowing when we go on. We don't like this. We don't like that. Oh, and yeah, I, yeah. I understand that. I can see why that can be frustrating just for me personally. What I loved about it was that uncertainty of not knowing if you were opening on the main stage or you were closing on the main stage. And yeah. I had both I had both experiences where we had to open sometimes and then I had the experience of having to go on after Pennywise in Canada and let's put it just blatantly honest, didn't go well. You know, yeah. like people, you know, or no, we had to go on, that's what it was. Twenty two jacks had to go on in between. That's right. We had to go on in between sick of it all and Pennywise. So when, <laughs> when they went over to us, everyone was like, all right, we're ready for Pennywise. And then, you know, yeah. here comes 22 Jacks with our collared shirts and slick back hair and people were not feeling it, you know, but we, <laughs> you know, we survived we yeah. barely. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, that, that's the other thing that you have to learn on, on the Warp Tours is like how to win over a crowd. And like, I, I mean, and some, some days are better than others. You know? like totally. That's just, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> totally. Well, you totally. mentioned uh, 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 22 Jacks, and we, as we said, that was with Chris uh, Shefflett. Um, yep. Uh, how did you guys meet, and what, what, what did you decide about, you know, why, why did you decide to do this project? And then I guess you uh, at Side One Dummy Records, you guys, um, if I'm not mistaken, signed his solo stuff too, right? Are yep, you guys still we did it that? all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Chris and I, so the way it kind of goes down like this, I, Chris was the first, uh, first person I ever jammed with when I moved to Hollywood. I came to Hollywood, and I started playing. Uh, I, was, I knew a guy who had a rehearsal studio and he was like, hey man, I saw you in your old band from Northern California. And I was like, oh cool. And this is like right when I moved to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I was jamming with him and it really wasn't going anywhere. And then he said, hey, look, I'm gonna have a drummer and a bass player come down. I said, great. So the, the drummer showed up and I was sitting outside and uh, this kid pulls up in a car, pulls out his bass and it's Chris. And I'm like, oh, hey man, what's up? And right away, Chris and I just hit it off and he wasn't even playing guitar. He was playing bass in this band mm -hmm. and, um, and him and I just hit it off. We were just very similar in the sense of like, he was from Santa Barbara. I was from Santa Cruz. Um, we just had a similar, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we loved the social distortion. We loved the clash. Like we just really bonded over that, over the, that style of music. And, and then we jammed in this band and it didn't really work out, but the best thing that came out of it was be, I met, I met Chris and we just became friends. So then when I, what ended up happening was, um, Chris was in a band with actually the partner that I started Side One Dummy with, Bill Armstrong. And at a certain point they needed a roommate and I moved into the house. So that's how I met my partner that I started Side One with. I was living with Chris and I was living with Scott, Scott Shiflett, who's in Face to Face, another amazing uh, musician. And then Chris, so there was a moment when all four of us were living together and we just, we were just all friends. I was in Wax, they were in their band. And what ended up happening was Chris and I, you know, obviously had always talked about starting a different band, but as, as Chris's career kind of started at a certain point, he ended up moving to San Francisco and he was a guitar player in No Use For A Name. And yeah. there was a downtime when Wax broke up and I was starting a new band, 22 Jacks. Chris and I had always talked about writing songs together. We wrote this song called So Sorry Together. And then when we made the record, you know, he played on it. And then when we put the band together, it was Steve Soto and I were like the, the two, like I would say the two founding members, members, Steve Soto from the adolescents. So mm -hmm. it was like Steve and I, and we were saying, man, we need another guitar player. You know, we need to kind of put it together. And the first guy that we reached out to with Chris, he wasn't doing anything at that point with, um, no use they were kind of in between records he's like yeah man i'll do the tour with you guys so that was kind of how it all came about and then at a certain point you know he's doing no use for a name he's doing stuff with 22 jacks and then that was right around the same time period that franz left uh the foo fighters and then mm -hmm. chris got the audition which was insane yeah we were all we were all you know we were all like you know he like the way you're happy the for him, but you were also like, oh, you're going to be gone for a while. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what? No, honestly, because we got it, what's really funny is my partner, Bill Armstrong, mm -hmm. was the one that got Chris into the audition. Oh, rad. So, so, so it's a weird thing. It's like this weird moment in time where Chris is back in 
I want to say he, he, I want to say he was flying out to New York or something, but I do. I remember I'm standing on a corner in New York city, Chris, at this point, I, we have another guitar. So at this point we already had a guitar player feel, like that was basically in the band, this guy named Bill Franz, an old friend of mine. And he was like, he was, he was the 22 Jacks guitar player because Chris, Chris was like, kind of like he was touring. And then when no use wasn't touring, he would play with us. So at a certain point, Chris was like, you know, you're going to have to find like a guy to do it all the time. We're like, got it. But I was, I was uh, in New York city and I'm hanging out and this guy, um, legendary guitar player, unfortunately he's passed away. Todd youth. Hmm. Um, he was in miss, he was in Danzig. He was in motorhead for mm -hmm. a second. He was in, um, uh, he was in Murphy's law. You know, he's this legendary New York hardcore guy, ripper guitar player. Him and I were bros. He kind of came out of, he came out and he's like, yo, you know, we're just sitting on a street corner. He goes, dude, did you hear that Franz left the foos? And we were like, and I'm standing on the corner. I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. And then um, they, and then he says, yeah, they're going to be auditioning guitar players. You know, Grohl's yeah. looking for a new guy. And the first thing I thought was, Oh, you know, Todd's going to do that. So I see yeah. Todd, I go, Oh, are you going to, are you going to try out? And he goes, no, man. He goes, I'm, I'm, I'm in Danzig. So I'm going to, I want to stay with that. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, cool. And then I say, dude, like, is that like cool? If I, if I try to throw, if, if, you know, I get someone in the mix, he's like, he's like, dude, you know, cause I didn't want to like, you know, step on anyone's toes. Yeah. So I literally, this is so long ago. I, there's no cell phones. I run back to my friend's apartment and I call my business partner bill yeah and i go dude did you hear about the food fighters and he goes yeah dude and i and he knew the attorney for uh he knew the attorney that like worked i don't want to say the attorney for like it might have been the attorney for the foods or the attorney for dave but long story short knew the attorney in that world yeah went to the okay. attorney and said you know what i've got the guy for the food fighters and i remember the woman said to bill like are you sure because i i you know i don't want to i don't want to send someone down there that they all go dude our attorney and, she, and yeah goes, that would be me. a very odd thing to and, and he said he's <laughs> saying on the other goes, side of that i could be like uh, our attorney sent somebody yeah. here <laughs> yeah our attorney's throwing a name in for the guitar player what are you talking about and yeah. sure enough sure enough she said he said in his you know he said trust me i've got the guy like this guy will deliver and he got the audition and then um, he went down. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I want to say he was like, I think legend goes, he was like the first guy or something. And Dave, mm -hmm. they ran a bunch of songs. And Dave supposedly, or they all said like, oh my God, like, dude, you nailed it. Like, but we have to try out all these other people. And he kind of was like, all right, man, well, you know, thanks a lot, late. And he was the first guy that did it all. And, you know, that, that went through. So they had to try out all the other guys. And then I do remember, you know, we were in this limbo, like, I was back in LA and like Chris, you know, we we're all kind of like, dude, have you heard anything? And then my partner was there when Dave called, uh, called the house and uh, yeah. said, Hey man, is Chris there? And he knew right away, fuck dude, that's girl. And he's like, dude, it's girl. And he gets on the phone and, and then they were like, Hey man, you know, like, and Chris like, yeah, they invited me back to jam again. And then it, you know, it turned into like, now we're going to hang out. And then all of a sudden it was just, I remember we all went to the first show that Chris got in the, in the, in the um, Foo Fighters. And it was so funny because he gets, he joins the band and in typical, like, you know, Foo Fighters fashion, they want to celebrate. So what do yeah. they do? We're going to do an unannounced show at the Troubadour. And it was like on a Friday. Nice. And you got to remember, I don't even know if the Foo Fighters knew, like Chris, you know, he's, he's just an amazing musician, but he's also like friends and just like such a lovable just an amazing like if you're friends with chris you're friends with this guy for life and he yeah. he had so many friends and his friends ran deep from fat mike to you know to me and marco and just all you know santa barbara and la and san francisco yeah and i'll never forget all like chris is like dude you know i'm doing my first show with the food fighters and you know i have a guest list and he fucking dude he got all of us in and i'll never forget we're all at the Troubadour and it's this unannounced show. So it's not like, you know, it's not like thousands of people, but it's like, yeah. you know, they just want to jam with their new guy. And I'll never forget. It was like, you had the Foo Fighters on stage, but everyone there was there to see Chris. Chris. So we're all on his <laughs> side of the stage. So it's like going to a wedding and you, and you, you pick that. There side. you go. And I remember Grohl was even like, fuck, like, you know, you could tell he was like, dude, this guy has a lot of friends that really want him to win. And we were, I mean, when Chris got in the Foo Fighters, dude, it's like that scene out of Goodfellas. It was like, it was, it was like, a made man. Know, and, yeah, dude. We, there was, there was never, 
there was never one i can honestly say this as as a musician and as a friend and as a guy that was this dude's roommate as a guy that played music with him on stage i never for one moment was like fuck why him like he was always so much, such a better player than all of us not not better like i mean i played with great guys but there was just something about him once again that you know he, he could learn a factor. song yeah him and his brothers it's almost it's weird it's like alien type stuff like there's these three shiftlet brothers that are so musically gifted from his older brother to scott to to um to chris that it's it's something i know i know a fan i know a family like that too that's called the wackermans and brooks is, is our drummer now <laughs> and the entire family is just super musical and super good it's it's amazing do you know brooks by the way i know brooks yeah i knew i've known brooks i uh gosh man i've known brooks that's actually a for, segment you know, on this show because he knows everybody that oh, and, yeah. and he's and he's jammed with everybody like uh, yeah uh, the segment on the show is do you know brooks wackerman or how do you know brooks wackerman yeah <laughs> yeah i know brooks i know uh brooks wackerman um i know him once again um i know him through obviously bad religion i know through him playing uh vandals too right he was in yeah. the vandals he, as well. yeah he, he, he yeah. fills in for for josh Friesler yeah. sometimes. and i god i'm i'm right now i'm if i'm if i'm thinking correctly um we did a record, um, this band called Pressure for Five, and it was this um, band that was on, um, it was a band that was on DreamWorks. I was managing them, and I'm almost positive Brooks, uh, our drummer, we had a drummer situation, and we Brooks came down and played drums on the record and just crushed it. And so, you know, I've <laughs> That known sounds Brooks, about right. <laughs> yeah. You know, like one of those kind of things like, hey, man, have you listened to it yet? No, I'll figure it out. And you're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Um, yeah, he was one of those kind of guys that, um, yeah, just to watch him play. I loved him in Bad Religion. You mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah, he was he was an amazing, amazing musician and also just, a, a, you know, like you said, comes from a musical family. But Chris definitely, Chris Shiflett was definitely um, one of those guys that when he when he got in the foos, there was no one that that felt anything except love. And like it, like I said, I felt like we all got in the band yeah. at that point. And I will say this. On, on behalf of the Foo Fighters and like, you know, um, anytime I've been invited by Chris to a show, um, you're always made to feel like you're, you're a guest and they have that ability to make you feel like you are a part of it. Like I, you know, I remember seeing them play at the forum and, you know, just, you're just like, wow, like they're, you know, they, they made that crew of people feel like we're all playing the forum tonight. Like it's weird. It's, it wow. wasn't like a, really you cool. guys are over there. Okay. You're friends with Chris. Then you hang out over there. It was more like, dude, fucking you want a shot. Let's go. You're like, all right, here we go. Is <laughs> Lemmy really DJing right now? Okay. You know, it's just yeah, so rad. Uh, that's rad. Oh, you just mentioned DJing too. So let's get into the, the Metallica when you were doing uh, DJing for that. How did that come together? And like you were on with uh, Jim Brewer as well, right? During yeah. that tour. Yeah. So yeah. how did that come I to be? And, and what... I mean, uh, I've 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 seen you talk about it before, and you you've already gone gone into stories. Everyone could go find a couple of those stories on Instagram, actually. Yep. Joe Sib, uh, Joe underscore Sib, and there you uh, go. That, that's right there on Instagram. But uh, just you know, real real quickly, can you r run me through what that was like and how that came together for you? I mean, dude, once again, you know, once again, um, Johnny, just like being in the right place at the right time, and also like not being afraid to say uh yes to something that like i should have said no to you know like my <laughs> like yeah you know what i'm saying like yeah like the way i got the gig i mean the thing was is you know i i i'd been out on the road and i'd become friends with jim brewer jim i opened for jim brewer one night in san diego and it was just like from the moment we met it was it was just weird it was like he was just the metal version east coast version of like me and him, I, I felt like, you know, like, I, I don't like to say like, oh, I have a brother, but like Jim was, our lives were so similar in so many ways. Like he loved Metallica and loved metal as much as I love punk rock. Like yeah. he, like when you're traveling with him, I remember, you know, he would, we would go on the road together and, and he would, you know, he travels. It's just awesome. Like as a comedian, you know, his whole thing was when I met him, um, we hit it off and he was like, you know, I, we did a couple shows together and then at a certain point he gave me a call and he was like, Hey man, um, if you're down for it, I'd love you to be my feature and you know, I'll give you my dates, you know, for the year and then all the shows that you can make it to, um, you're on. Mm -hmm. And then if you can't make it, just let me know. And then, you know, I'll have my other guy, like he kind of had three people and I kind of, I was like at the top 
And that's what comics do is, and you know, he was straight with me from the beginning. He said, Hey man, you know, cause at a certain point, you know, I'm on the road with him for like a year and a half and we're yeah. doing just amazing. And, and at one point he kind of pulled me aside and said, Hey dude, you know, just so you know, like, you know, as a comedian, you, you know, you can't be the feature forever. Cause at a certain point I got to come back to these markets and I can't bring you again. And in my head, I was like, Oh my God, I never want this to end because it was like, you know, you're dude, it's the best venues. Every night's sold out as a comedian, you go on before him. So you only, you do like 25 minutes where you just get a, yeah. just the audience is ready for you. And if you're, if you're fucking a decent comedian, you're going to crush. And I just really connected with his audience. You know, I didn't swear. I talked about like my upbringing, you know, even though it was different than gyms and music, but we were very similar in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. So it just, it connected. But, um, I remember, um, like even traveling with Jim, like he loves metal so much. That I remember like, you know, when you come out on the road with him, this was the thing that was great. All his only thing was this. He was like, you just got to take care of yourself getting there and getting home. I take care of everything else. He pays you. He puts you up at the hotel and like, wow, and you're, that's really nice. and you're yeah. like, you're like, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. It's just top notch. But I remember when we would, he would go he, and he loved to drive. He'd be like, all right, dude, meet me at, you know, we'd land at the airport, fucking Escalade shows up. And I'm like, oh, well, I'll drive. He's like, no, no, I'll drive. He gets in there. But from the moment, dude, he gets in, he would fucking put on just metal. And like, yeah. I love metal, but dude, 8 a.m. Just fucking gong, 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 gong. <laughs> fucking dude, two hours into the drive, gong, gong, gong. gong. I'm like, <laughs> and, then, and then every once in a while, he would switch it up and go to like hair metal ballads from the 80s. And I'm just like, oh my God, dude, <laughs> if I hear Skid Row one more time, and he's just singing. <laughs> He's just, you know, whether it's a Aussie I love ballad, it all. I love it would, all. Oh my God, he would. He just loves metal, you know, yeah. like he, he, you know, he it's anything that had metal. And he's, in a certain point, you know, you're just like, you're like, dude, we've been listening, and not, and he's not listening to metal low, dude. He's jamming it. Yeah. And and you know, you're in the car, and you don't want to be lame, so you're like, okay, okay, this is cool. Yeah, <laughs> Tesla's cool. All right, yeah, they're cool. You're like, you're trying to find like something you like. Some about of the kids it. don't know that Tesla was a band and not a, a car company. So they're, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Weren't they out of Sacramento originally? I think Were so. Of, yeah, I think yeah, so. yeah. God, I can't believe I know that. But anyway, <laughs> um, so the thing that ended up happening was while we'd be out on the road together, you know, he, I knew this. Uh, he was friends with, you know. James and Lars, and they were like really friendly to the point where, you know, he, they would talk to each other, no different than you and I, which mm -hmm. was a trip to me because I was like, Oh my God, you're friends with Lars and James. This is nuts. And at a certain point, um, one day we're, we're out on the road and he, and he says to me, man, I just got a crazy call. You know, James is saying that they're going on tour and they're not going to bring a band. And, and he, they just asked me like, would I put together a show and be the opening act? And I was just like, are you serious? And he's like, oh, yeah. Very different. And I remember just going like, <laughs> And there was a part of me, and I always joke around about it on stage, where I was like, bad idea, man. Like, I don't know, man. I, I don't want anything to do with that. Like, it'll be cool to come well, that's see what you. That's what makes Metallica Metallica, though. They always push the envelope. You know, they're always Dude, trying they, something new. And and I can tell you this. So then basically what ended up happening was as it as we traveled together, we would talk about, like, he would say, you know, like, I, you know, I would do this. And what do you think about this? And we just kind of started brainstorming ideas. And at a certain point... He, you know, he said to me, uh, he goes, look, man, you know, I spoke to Lars today and they said I could, you know, I could bring someone and I'd, I'd love to bring you. Would you be down? And I was like, fuck, yes. Yeah. And he's like, I didn't even know what I'd be doing. I didn't even know I would be a part of the show. I thought I would just be kind of like in the background, like, oh, yeah, dude. You know, and then he was like, no, no, I want you to be like a part of it. And he's like, I want you to DJ. Do you know how to DJ? And I was like, yeah, dude, fucking all the time, which I don't know how to DJ. <laughs> I love was, when people do this. You got to fit. You just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just say yes to everything. Oh yeah. I was like, dude, DJing right now. Here you go. I'm, you know, what's up? Look, I got the headphones, you know, like, and then, and and then you're just, doing it in front of 50,000 people. Oh God. I remember, dude, I remember the first night, you know, 23,000 people, Madison, Wisconsin. I mean, I knew I was in over my head, you know, yeah. but the thing that was so great though, we ended up, you know, first night was a little rough, but, uh, we got it together and you know, people I, I will say this we went you know we went from one night it being you know we came i always say like it was like an airplane we came in for the landing and you know there was definitely fire engines on the runway and it was sprayed down we landed it uh, <laughs> and it was sketchy but by the time we got to minneapolis two days later we had the foundation for the show we ended up doing for the rest of the 37 shows and by the end dude i mean to this day i mean it changed my comedy career because anywhere i go fans from metallica 
come out, you know, they have their Metallica yeah. chapter, they come to the shows and they'd be like, we saw you in Des Moines. We saw you in, you know, we saw you in, uh, you know, Cincinnati. We saw you in Cleveland, you know, they'll come out to the That's shows. Cool. I'd be, I ended up befriending so many of these fans. And, and, you know, at first the Metallica fans, you know, they weren't, they, they were very like, why isn't a band coming? And by the end, these hardcore Metallica fans, you know, were giving us, you know, they gave us this amazing, like a group of fans gave us this book they made with all these photographs of Jim and I from the whole tour. And then they gave Jim, you know, amazing gifts and they, they were just so kind. But the, the thing was the, the show, it was amazing what we ended up doing because no one had ever done it. And the thing that was so amazing is what Jim ended up doing because Jim mm -hmm. was doing in the, in, during the show, he was doing 45 minutes of stand up, all based in metal and in his way and crushing in front of 23,000 people That's and right. also doing he was doing crowd work at, at, at shows that was just it was it was amazing and, and he you know and he really incorporated me into the show where he didn't need to and he did and he and and I felt like we had this um we had this moment in time where we were like I used to tell him dude this is what it's like being in a band and mm -hmm. he's like I get what you're saying because you know he, he was he was the front man and I was I was I was his kind of like you know his eyes for like you know hey talk to that person or hey dude yeah okay you know you want it you you know you know it'd be cool is that if we went into this slayer song after this bit and he's like oh i love that so like you know we really worked together yeah and collaborated the, and the, a lot on it which is collaborated great. a lot and the one thing i think so important for you know your fans to know and for everyone was you know metallica they just like you said they trusted jim and ultimately him for for the whole entire tour and they never once came in and said hey you know even after the first night where it was a little rough they just laughed and they said you'll figure it out and they never they never management lars james they never once tried to like drop in or or say you should do it this way or you should do it that way they gave us so much freedom dude that i'll be honest it was almost like they gave us so much freedom that we really could have fucked up. Like we could have seriously, but it was weird. They had so much confidence in yeah. Jim and his, and, and kind of like where it was going that that freedom allowed us to ultimately do what we did. But I remember nights, like I remember one night I, uh, I played the pistols. Cause that was the other thing that was cool, dude. Yeah. I would play like, I would play everything from like a dropkick Murphy's track into like a sex pistols track into an old prong track. And Shit. I remember, one night I played prong and, uh, and the, you know, crowd stoked. And, um, I remember the manager, uh, Mark Ryder, I see him like pushing his way through the audience, you know, cause I was on the floor, like down in the pit. So I was with the fans and they would come over and it was like anyone that made a request, you know, like I'd throw them a pick. It was like this, it was just, it was like a party. It was insanity. Yeah. And I remember I see Mark Ryder coming through the audience and I'm like, Oh God, man, I must've fucked up now. Like, why has he got that look on his face? He comes over and goes, Hey, did you just play the sex pistols into prong? And I go, yeah. And he goes, fuck yeah. And he just leaves. I'm like, that was the only, and then like, I remember one night, like one night, like the guy, the tech for, or the, or Frank who works with Lars, he comes over and he has the same thing, like walking over to me. He goes, he goes, Hey, he goes, did you just play queen? And I go, yeah. yeah. And he goes, fucking Lars said he loves that song. He wants to request a song with you. So then we started doing a thing where Lars would be backstage. He'd be like, Hey, hey, Joe, Joe, it's Lars. Uh huh. Can I fucking hear like some fucking deep purple, bro? I, I got to say that that uh, that, uh, that imperson impersonation right there was pretty spot on. I yeah. Went, <laughs> only <laughs> knowing Lars I, for a while now, that was pretty okay. good. <laughs> okay, but can I tell you right now that I totally pinched that uh, from Jim because Jim. Uh, yeah. That's just me sitting around Jim for days on end, listening to him do that yeah. impersonation. Well, the guys in Metallica Dude, are just so great. I, I love that you you had yeah. similar experience. We've been on. I've we've done tours with them uh you know and it, from the very first day like them coming backstage and like talking to us and hanging out and like you know it was like well you're fucking metallica and you're just like gonna talk to me like a normal human being this is awesome like now it but now it now it's now it's okay but at the time the first time it happens you're like whoa and then like it becomes you know they're just such good dudes you know it just and, it changes and the everything. thing that i think that johnny you know it and the thing that's why like the thing that i realized is it's the reason that band is so successful and the reason that band resonates with people and always will is because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. And I feel that even the people they hire from top to bottom, all 
have that same attitude. Like there's almost this unwritten rule that if you're going to work for that band, you are the best at your job. Like I know the lighting director for, um, for Metallica and he's the best. Mm -hmm. It's like he, he, he's worked for everybody from, you know, from fucking, um, you know, uh, from fucking, um, I'm spacing on his name. Uh, God, I'm spacing on it. And I was going to watch this and be like, dude, you said I was the best. <laughs> you said I was the best, but then you re couldn't remember anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel so bad. Oh my God. But he's worked with everybody, guns, everybody. He's yeah. the best. And he, now he's, you know, Metallica's guy. And, and the thing is, he's the best. Then you have the sound man, Big Mick. He's the best. Then you have the guys that run the stage. They're the best. The crew, the riggers, everyone that is doing everything is the best of the best. And it's almost like they all have this unspoken rule amongst themselves that if you're going to work for us, you got to carry yourself in a certain way with a certain professional attitude. And it all really comes down, I swear, from Lars and James. And, and the thing people would say to me, and you know this from touring from people would say, hey, what's James really like? And I was like, the only difference with James on stage and off stage, in my opinion, was when I would see him during the day, he would have a motorhead shirt on, cowboy hat and like Levi's. And then at night, the only difference was the hat was gone. He had a black shirt on and black pants. That's it. <laughs> it was the only difference. Yeah. No, no, no. And, is, I, and yeah. the only, and the only thing I ever saw, the only other, the only thing that I ever saw was, was that different carried himself in such a pro way. Um, that it, it was inspiring, man. It really was. Yeah, it was like, yeah that, that was, was that was my experience too. I mean, it, just being around them. I mean, the first time we were around them was in 2006 when we toured with them. I mean, I remember when Metallica came out and watched one of our concerts in San Francisco. We were at a fuck the Fillmore, I believe, and like you know, 2,000 people, and they came out, and like it was a huge deal for us. And it was totally. like back in like 2004 or something like that. And then we ended up touring with them in Europe did some Mexico shows, everything, all that. And it was, as you said, so inspiring to see how they, how they worked behind the scenes. And it was just like, it was like, that's how yeah. you do it. That's how yeah. you fucking do it. And that was, yeah. that was really cool. Um, I always tripped out on the tour too, at least for me. I, 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 I'll never forget this. I mean, I was on the road with them for 35 days or 35, sorry. I was on the road for six months with them, 35 shows or 37 shows. And one of the things I'll, and I, and, and maybe I missed it or whatever was I never even saw the crew or when they were loading in or when, cause every night, you know, they're setting up this or for two days. It takes to set up that whole fucking thing. And I never heard anyone yelling at someone. I never heard any like you know, obviously, you know, some nights there was tension, you know, obviously between somebody trying to get something done before it had to go. But I never, I never heard any of the things I heard on other tours, you know, and maybe, maybe mm -hmm. because I was an artist on the tour, maybe when I rolled up, maybe it was like, okay, there was two dudes just fighting. Now there's someone that's actually on the tour. We got to bring it down, you know, whatever. But I never, ever, ever picked up on anything, but just, just like a, just a, it was like a greased wheel that was just working. So well, I think that's, I, and, and yeah. And I think that that's part of, as you said, like you, they handpicked that stuff too, you know, through management and everybody is like, I know from us, we've, we've taken that with our crew is the fucking best now. Like we, and we've gone through a lot of changes, you know, but like with the, you know, and sometimes those changes are just because not because you can't get the job done. It's because you're not meshing with the rest of the crew. Totally. And you got to figure that out. And that's like, that's, that's part of it. You know, you, you guys are going to so, live together. You guys are going to yeah. live together. So you got to be yeah. able to fucking figure it oh, out. Literally. literally. <laughs> I mean, I'll say this, the last thing I'll say about the Metallica tour, man. And, and it, I'll say this dude, when it was over, it was the only time ever in my life I was depressed because I mean, oh my God, the way we were traveling, the way that, you know, I mean, every day it was just so it was, it was, you know, as a, as a dude that played music, you know, mm -hmm. I always wanted to, you know, when, it, it, when I was a kid, you know, when I heard ride the lightning or kill them all, like I, I always imagine, oh my God, it'd be so rad to be in my band and open for Metallica. And, it, and the thing I'll just say is this, is that life never turns out the way that you think it is going to turn out. And, and that is such a prime example, because if you would have told me, Johnny, when I was in any of my bands, Hey man, you know, you're going to go on tour someday with Metallica I, or just, you're going to go on tour where you're, you know, on the bus and, and it's it's 150 people and you're staying at the best hotels and you're flying and you're and it's just like anything you want i'd be like oh my god what band will i be in and then you say to me no you're gonna be um, DJing. no you're gonna be djing <laughs> and you're gonna be doing like comedy i'd be like oh my god what a nightmare and it was <laughs> it was such it was so amazing to have that experience and That's when it so was cool. over man 
I was, I seriously, Jim and I would text each other and I would be like, dude, I'm so sad right now. And he'd be like, I know. I just want to be at catering. That's what he used to say. I just want to go to catering. Catering's always good, man. Catering's always good. I want to have good. fajitas. I want the little slice of pie. Like, yeah. Oh, I want oh, to be man. on the bus again with yeah, the that's guys. So I mean, we had so much fun. It was yeah. just, yeah. It was it's, it's always a blast with those guys. And I'm glad you got the same experience. I was asking you about your microphone earlier before we started hit record too, because you got your own podcast podcast right and that, yes. that's is well, that the microphone you use for that well you know what no you know what so so the podcast that i had um it ended uh, sadly enough when oh. i started doing the metallica tour because the woman and i i had a parenting podcast called rad parenting yeah that's right which is totally ironic because i'm not a rad parent um and uh <laughs> yeah it basically was uh basically it was uh she's the expert he's not and yeah. i basically would bring in all of the questions and it sounds it, like honestly, my house she's the expert yeah, i'm for, not <laughs> yeah, for anyone, for anyone that's a parent, or for anyone that's you know where Johnny's at with kids that are young, I, I strongly suggest check out Rad Parenting. We did we did quite a few episodes. I want to say maybe a hundred, wow. and it it, it ta we talk about everything from nursing to you know how to be a united front with you know the mother and father or the two partners that are raising the kids and it and and one it's one of the proudest things i've ever been a part of because it, even if you read the comments on itunes for the reviews of the show i've never really been a part of anything that had that big of an impact on people like people loved the co-host um yeah Sometimes people said I talked too much, but you know, that was the reason why I wasn't the expert. So, you know, there you go. I get that a couple um, of times too. I got yeah, yeah. You know, people are like, Oh God, Johnny, let Joe talk. I mean, in yeah. this one, they're gonna be like, dude, does Joe ever not talk? <laughs> this will um, be the different one. They'll be like, Oh, he actually let the guests talk today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but 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 it's funny though, you know, the podcast Rad Parenting, that's definitely um we did we did it for about two years. It was an amazing podcast. And and honestly, it's a podcast if you're really looking for information on how um to possibly uh help with um with tough topics with your kids. I mean, I'm these, the topics we kind of tackled, it, it was insane. We talked, we talked about like, um, like how, when you have your young child, so they start sleeping in their own bed. We had like yeah. the best sleep expert on the show. We had the best nutritionist on the show. We had the best, um, we had this, uh, therapist on the show. We had trigger words. There's so many things That's that right. like, I never, like, I never even knew, and it made me a much better father. I just realized I just I, said yeah. I just I just realized I said that's rad when you're talking about rad parenting. Talking about rad parenting, <laughs> it was great doing that podcast. I did it for two years, and to but what I am starting right now is I'm about to launch a new podcast that's totally the opposite. It's called True Stories and Bad Ideas, where I have people on the show like yourself mm -hmm. uh like a duff mckagan uh like a, um sarah silverman like like anyone from the world that i love music comedy uh anything and basically i have them on the show and basically they tell a story um that is true or an idea or something that happened and it doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. like, Oh my God, you know, I, I had this, I had this experience where everything, you know, was shitty. It's, you know, it can be, it can be like the experience I just talked about with Metallica. It could be yeah. your experience when you joined the band. It could be, it could be anything that you want. And that basically cool. what we do is we narrow down those stories and the, that to, to a show. And um, yeah, I'm super excited to do it. And we're going to do like, it's going to be more of a season show. Like there'll be 14 episodes per season. And then cool. we go from there. Yeah, very cool. Well, I'm, I'm I'm excited to check that one out too. So I'll I'll, I'll be listening. I'm excited to start it. Yeah, <laughs> you be a guest. Absolutely. Will you be a guest? Yeah, anytime, okay, man. Cool. You, 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 you got my contact now. We, what well, we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> I can't wait to sit at that bar with you, man. Yeah, soon soon enough. We'll have to do this again sometime in person have a drink when you're drinking again if you ever do <laughs> dude if not, not it's still okay <laughs> i'm not a quitter i'm not a quitter man all right everyone go check out joseph um anywhere um it's easy enough to find him you can find him on twitter at joseph or as i said on instagram joe underscore sib so much more we can get into but we're going to cut it off for the for now this time and we'll have you back another time um thanks again so much for being on the show joe Thank you so much, Johnny. And if anyone wants to hit me up an email too, any questions you got, anything you got going on, hit me up at Joe Sib, the number 22 at gmail.com. Joe Sib 22 at gmail.com. You give out your Thank emails? You. I know, dude. You're like yeah. all over, man. You're crazy. 
you know, um, I just, I, I, you know, I'm honored that you'd have me on the show. And, you know, I just watched the one with Bentley. So, you know, I was, I was super stoked to be a part of this and you've had, you've had some really great guests on it. Yeah, I'm we've sorry, been sorry really that lucky with that. So the far. bar was lowered with me. I hope that, you know, people enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Thanks again, man. Thanks Cheers. for having me, brother.